Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first installment of the microscopy webinar series. Today, we will be doing an introduction on how to build a microscope. We have six different episodes um, ready for you. And the rest of the series, we will go over various microscopy and imaging techniques from the ground up. I'm Pauline Non. I'm an engineering manager at Torlabs Imaging Systems, and I'm a go-to resource for any imaging or microscopy needs. With me today is Craig Samansky. He is our life science specialist who has over 18 years of experience in microscopy including optical, electron, and x-ray imaging modalities. We're part of the Imaging Systems Division, composed of researchers, development engineers, application scientists, sales and service engineers. We look forward to helping our customers determine the best imaging system for their specific needs. Um, our staff is based out of eight offices in four continents. Um, our division was founded in Sterling, Virginia in 2009 when Tor Labs entered the microscopy market uh, with our first multifoton microscope. Since then, we have two groups that have been formed, focus in research and the other in development and production. Uh, we are responsible for the Cerna DIY imaging platform and Bergamo multifoton microscope. We also have commercialized a two-photon random access microscope developed by the Saboda Lab at HHMI as well as uh, acquired exclusive rights to the vessel beam volumetric imaging techniques. Throughout this webinar series, we will share tips and techniques to what we have acquired over the years. We look forward to your participation to the rest of the series. I'm going to hand over the presentation to Craig now. We will be accepting questions throughout the webinar. You can type in your question using the button in the type right hand corner of your screen. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, as Pauline mentioned, uh, I'm Craig Szymanski, and I'm going to be telling you the basics of building a microscope. So uh, within this event, we're going to talk about uh, basics of modalities, hardware, optics, uh, some differences in geometry, um, and focus on some of the key aspects that uh, translate uh, some questions you might have uh, about almost any microscope system. Uh, other details about other more specific methods will be in later webinars. So uh, we're going to start with the parts of a microscope, uh, including the body uh, and some ge different geometries you can have with that, uh, illumination methods, uh, and imaging. So first off, what is a microscope? Um, at a fundamental level, a microscope is just something that helps you see very small things more easily. Um, so let's see. Earlier ones used uh, a single lens, as you can see in the upper left corner there. Let me uh, get my tool here. Um, uh, and uh, modern ones use uh, systems of uh, lenses. So you can see this is basically a microscope uh, built on an optical rail for a demo or research purpose. Uh, we have USB micro, well, we and others have USB microscopes. Uh, paper microscopes exist, wooden microscopes, all kinds of things. Um, the ones uh, that we are going to highlight for you right now are uh, the Thor Labs microscopes. Uh, so we have a simple wide field green fluorescent protein uh, fluorescence microscope here, uh, a Cerna microscope, um, a DIY kind of thing here, uh, an inverted microscope and a multi-photon rotating uh, microscope here. So these first two are built uh, primarily from DIY components. Many of the individual components are available on the website, and these are just suggested builds uh, that are pre-configured. So if you want that collection of parts, we make it very easy to obtain those. But if you want a different collection, you can just select whatever you want. Um, the inverted platform is uh, mostly a microscope body. Um, it is available as turnkey confocal wide field or multi-photon uh, configurations, but uh, these components inside of here are uh, all configurable. So there's uh, optical breadboard setups where you can build your entire optical setup within an inverted platform for whatever you're trying to do. Um, the multi-photon platforms are a little bit less flexible, but there are configurations which have uh, breadboards uh, on them 
that allow you to build your own uh, optical pathways on top of what we've constructed. There's also DIY multi-photon kits that are uh, separate from the Bergamo systems you see here uh, that are in the CERNA line. So uh, the parts of the microscope that we're going to talk about, the body, uh, the illumination, and the detection and imaging. If we're going to use the CERNA platform as an example here, um, so you can see all the components uh, over here. So the body of the microscope uh, at its core serves as a stable platform for all the other optics. So um, its importance is that it must provide a stable platform for all the optics to remain registered and alignment, have a common optical axis. It needs to be fairly rigid so that um, as temperature changes, as you add more components to the system, uh, it doesn't you know, flex uh, and, and unreasonably so. There's uh, height considerations for how much you want to have below the um, how much you want to have below the objective. Uh, and then there's throat considerations, which is defined as the depth between or the depth or distance between this primary optical axis here and the rest of the body of the microscope. Um, that that can limit what experiments you can do. Uh, and there are a variety of heights and uh, the throat is mostly uh, similar among CERNA setups, but you could build your own. Uh, so a difference in geometry that does come down to the body of the microscope is uh, upright versus inverted microscope bodies. So uh, if any random person on the street thinks of a microscope, they're probably going to picture an upright setup. So that's a setup where you have the objective uh, above the sample. Um, the sample would be here, the objectives here, and uh, many of the optical components, uh, optical components are going to be uh, above the sample or above and to the side, that kind of thing. Uh, for an inverted microscope setup, the sample is uh, on a, some kind of platform and the objective is down below and many of the optical component components are below and this kind of goes around uh, to your uh, imaging apparatus being, uh, in this case, a camera and eyepieces. Um, Upright setups are great when you need a lot of space, when you have some apparatus or uh, some awake, alive animal perhaps, uh, and you want to image it. Um, you have an uneven service and you may need to move that around and get in close uh, from above. Uh, physiology setups uh, will often use that. Uh, an inverted setup is for uh, thin samples, in vitro samples where you've grown it perhaps on a cover glass and uh, the cells on that cover glass, you want to image them as close and as high magnification as possible. The inverted setup lets you get a high magnification objective, usually with a pretty short uh, focal or working distance. And it's going to be able to approach that sample and image it really, really well uh, from down below. So uh, now the illumination, we have uh, epi versus trans illumination. So epi illumination is a setup where you have the microscope um, you have the uh, illumination approach the sample through the objective from, uh, in this case, above. So the light comes down, uh, then light comes back up through the objective and it transfers, uh, it, it's imaged onto, in this case, a camera or an eyepiece. So that's epi illumination. It's used for fluorescence or uh, reflection uh, microscopy primarily. Then there's trans or transmitted illumination, which comes from down below. In this case, we have an LED that the light comes up through this, uh, through a couple of lenses here, through a condenser uh, to the sample, and then that passes through the sample into the objective up to your, your imaging methods up here. So um, trans illumination is used for, as I said, transmission. So the light needs to go through and there needs to be some effect uh, on the light from the sample. So very, very thin samples uh, are, are good, but they can be a little tricky to uh, eliminate. So there's uh, techniques such as differential interference contrast, DIC, uh, dot gradient contrast, uh, oblique and dark field microscopy. Uh, those are methods to improve the contrast. And we're gonna talk about that. Right, I think we have an image. Okay, so there's um, imaging uh, as well. So uh, imaging is your method of actually seeing your sample. So it can be as simple as uh, putting a putting some oculars here and 
just using your eyes. So those are great imaging sensors. Uh, but of course, if you want something that's maybe a little higher speed, uh, more sensitive, or uh, can operate in different color channels, that kind of thing, you might want a camera. Um, so cameras, eyepieces, and scanners of various kinds, I'm gonna leave that a little bit vague for now, um, can be used to actually acquire the images uh, of your sample and save them to disk, et cetera. So, um, I'm going to discuss uh, some of these imaging concepts for more details on cameras. Uh, we have a previous webinar uh, that you can see at thrillabs.com slash webinars. Now uh, I'm going to talk about imaging and uh, we're going to cover a lot of territory here. So um, this is really the core of uh, many of the questions we get. Um, so uh, it's about microscope objectives, about uh, reading microscope objectives and understand what the heck all those numbers mean. And I'm also gonna talk about key concepts such as numerical aperture, resolution, field of view, and uh, tube lenses and why they matter and what the heck they're for. So um, uh, a long time ago, like I said, uh, simple microscopes might just be essentially a magnifying glass. They had a simple lens, uh, in this case, a biconvex lens that just, um, just has a curvature on both sides. Uh, in that case, it has a defined focal length in front and behind, uh, same, same in this case. So there's an object in front uh, at some distance A in front of the uh, lens. And then there's a, uh, this is relayed to an image uh, some distance behind B. So we can use the lens makers formula, which is nice and simple. One over F equals one over A plus one over B to calculate if we do have an object some distance in front A, where is it relayed to behind uh, at distance B? Um, also the magnification is easily defined. It's just the, the ratio of B over A. But uh, people rapidly figured out that maybe this wasn't uh, as far as we could go with uh, imaging things. So there's also thick lenses, and there's some various reasons why you might have thick lenses. In this case, it's an achromatic lens, uh, which means that it's uh, it reduces the influence of different wavelengths and how they focus. Uh, it's, it's a bit more uniform in that respect. So uh, this is pretty much the same as uh, the thin lens uh, with a small exception. Um, instead of the distance uh, for, from A and B being from the center of the lens, it's from a principal plane that's within the lens. And that will be specified in the documentation uh, for the lens somewhere. So uh, if you take the distance from the principal plane for F and A and B, uh, the math actually works out pretty much the same. So we have the lens maker's formula, one over F, blah, blah, blah. We have magnification B over A, pretty much the same thing. So, um, but we can go further than that, of course. And now we have uh, objectives. So objectives are just basically a stack of lenses, uh, all designed and picked to work together. So they will have a principal plane inside the objective and a uh, defined focal length. So the focal length in front and behind from the principal plane, just like before. So we have an object in front, A distance uh, in front and B behind. Um, and it relays that to the image plane. But uh, this is what I've labeled the uh, old type objective. So um, it's designed so that the object is some distance out in front, but it's not at the focal plane. Uh, this limits you a little bit. So you ha do have an imaging plane, which is super convenient if you want to have only one optic. You put a thing in front, you image it somehow behind with your eyes or a camera, and uh, that's all you need. But uh, the industry quite a while ago moved to infinity correction. Now, what, what does that mean? So in that case, it's designed so that the uh, object will uh, be ideally positioned at the focal plane. So if we now look at our lens makers formula one more time, if one over F equals one over A, the one over B goes to zero uh, or uh, B goes to infinity, which means that collimated rays are coming out of the back of the objective, um, which makes it kind of hard to image. How do you image collimated rays? Well, uh, we'll get to that in a moment, but this advantage is uh, for those collimated rays, you can put your other optics as far back as you want. And um, as long as the light is collimated, it'll behave pretty much the same, whether your optics behind are, are uh, really close or further away. 
So this gets to the actual purpose of a tube lens. You've probably heard of them and the tube lens of this focal length, that focal length. Well, the purpose of a tube lens is to take these collimated rays and focus them onto an imaging plane. So your camera sensor, your eyepieces, your scanner, et cetera, whatever uh, can be at this location. And uh, the tube lens focuses down onto it. Now, um, the cool part about this is we can have two different objectives. And as long as the rays are collimated coming out of the back, uh, we can swap them out and the tube lens will just do its job. So the parallel rays come in, they get focused onto an imaging plane. Uh, that's what this uh, 4X magnification objective is doing. Uh, but if we switch out for a 10X magnification objective, uh, we're gonna see that the collimated rays come out, they get focused onto an imaging plane just the same. And uh, the imaging, uh, the, as long as these uh, objectives are from the same manufacturer, uh, you'll even find that the image uh, size, the imaging area is about the same. Um, this also introduces a, a couple of other terms that are useful to be aware of. There's par focal distance, which is the distance uh, when you screw in the objective, it's the distance from where the back of the objective sits to where your object is uh, supposed to be. So if you have two objectives which have the same par focal distance, you can switch them out and you don't have to move your object, you don't have to move your tube lens, you can just swap your objectives very easily. And uh, objective turrets are, designed uh, primarily this way and manufacturers are pretty careful about that usually. Uh, there's also the working distance, which is the distance from the object to the front of the objective. And this is measured in millimeters. It might be very short. It might be, uh, you know, uh, one millimeter. It might be half a millimeter and it might be a couple of inches. Probably not very often that long, but maybe fairly long. Um, and that's a good value to keep in mind. If your sample is hard to approach, if it's very delicate, um, you may want a longer working distance, uh, something to consider. So we have a couple more objectives here and we're gonna zoom in and take a look at what all those numbers and values mean, because there is a lot to digest there. So first of all, there's a mounting thread. Uh, you'll want to look at your microscope. Does it have an M32? Does it have M25? Does it have RMS? These are all different threads and you can get adapters and stuff, but it's kind of tough to turn a small thread, use a small thread with a big objective. You're going to pay kind of a penalty in terms of imaging quality there. So you'll want to be aware of that and, and take note of that. Um, so there's magnification. That's how much bigger, of course, uh, it will the relayed image it will be than the actual object. Uh, there's numerical aperture, and I'll get to the details of some of these things, including this in a, in a minute. So numerical aperture is uh, an idea of how effectively the objective collects light. Um, the higher the numerical aperture, the better the resolution, the brighter your image, all other things being equal. Uh, each objective is designed to work with a particular medium. Uh, in this case, the objective on the left is an oil immersion objective. It says very clearly right there. Uh, you'll want to check, you know, certain manufacturers prefer different oils. So um, if you don't match those, um, you can pay some penalty in terms of imaging quality, but it won't usually won't be disastrous for your imaging or anything. Um, the, this one indicates it's affinity corrected. Most of them do and most of them are. Uh, it, it's designed to work with a uh, 0.17 millimeter or 170 micron thick uh, cover glass uh, as indicated there. And the field number is the size of the relayed imaging plane. And I'll talk about what that means in a minute. But this value, the bigger this value, all other things being equal, the bigger the area you're going to be able to successfully image uh, with this objective. So if, if we just change this number to a 20, it's gonna image a smaller area, but if we only change that. So uh, there's also a magnific magnification color code there. So uh, we have a blue, uh, which indicates 40x or you know it, there's a little bit of a uh, slop there so light blue is 40x uh, and red is a 4 or 5x around there yellow is a 10x uh, green is a 20x or 16x i think is also green so kind of covers territory so you can at a glance figure out which objective you're looking for in a drawer full of objectives um, it has an immersion objective identifier. So for black, uh, black is an oil immersion objective, uh, but white is for water immersion. And uh, if it has no ring at all, it's for air. 
Now, this one on the other side has uh, a lot of the same uh, features. Uh, plan floor refers to uh, inform its information about the color and geometrical focal corrections that are done with that objective. Uh, you might wonder why a $500 objective might be $500, but a $5,000 objective is $5,000. Um, there's a few things that go into that, but part of it may be uh, the color and focal corrections that go into it. Uh, there's going to be more lenses. They're going to be more precisely machined, that kind of thing. Um, this is a 60X objective with a 0.85 NA, so it doesn't get quite the resolution uh, of the one on the left uh, because the NA is lower. Um, it can operate, it's infinity corrected, and it can operate with a uh, microscope, with a cover glass of uh, 110 microns up to about 230 microns. Uh, and that's adjustable. If you have different microns here, you'll want to adjust this correction ring to account for that. Um, and magnification color code is blue. And uh, the retraction stopper is uh, when you bring your objective in, if you bump into your sample or bump into anything, that last little bit will go into the microscope and into the objective a little bit uh, to keep you from damaging it. So uh, really important if you're adjusting your microscope and you find that your focus isn't changing anymore, maybe you're bumping and you need to take a real close look at your sample before you break your sample or break your objective. So uh, yeah, we're going to discuss four interrelated topics. So some slides are going to have terms from other slides, including numerical aperture, resolution, uh, field size and field of view, and tube lenses. So numerical aperture is a dimensionless value. So it describes the collection power of the microscope or, the, or, or of a system. So we have is relevant uh, relevant for excitation and imaging and it's commonly expressed as na equals the ni or the index of refraction of the imaging medium uh, times the sine of the collect the collection half angle so here we have an objective with um, oil on one side and air on the other so if this is an oil objective the light rays are emitted from the sample uh, they come out in uh, a, a range of angles, of course. So uh, ones that come straight out, of course, make it into the objective. Ones that are off to the side a bit, make it into the objective. Ones that go way out, eh, well, in the oil side, they make it into the objective as well. So they exit this glass uh, cover slip. They enter the oil, which is pretty close to the index of refraction of the glass cover slip and the objective. Uh, and they go straight into the uh, objective here. So there's no changes in index. So this beam doesn't uh, change angle. Um, and this allows a very wide angle of light that made it out of the sample to actually successfully get it into the objective. So the left side of this objective would be a high NA objective. It has a very wide collection angle. Uh, on the right side, however, we have an air objective. They're still useful for obviously tons of things, but they tend to have lower NA. Um, so we have a beam that goes straight out. It makes it into the objective. We have a beam that goes a bit out to the side uh, and it refracts uh, off to the right at a steeper angle, but it's still collected. It ultimately makes it into the objective. But any beams past here, any beams that were coming out at an angle uh, further out than this are going to refract and miss the objective, or they're going to totally internally reflect uh, like this one. So um, there is a dependence of uh, numerical aperture on the index of refraction. So for an error medium, it's going to be limited to an NA that is lower than 1.0. That's just physics and index of refraction. That's how it is. Uh, then there's water medium, which goes up to an NA of about 1.15 is the closest, is the highest I could easily find. Uh, 1.0 to 1.1 are kind of more common. Um, that's great for physiology live samples. If you're imaging a fish, it probably doesn't want to be in air or in oil. So that's uh, very helpful there uh, or any kind of buffered, you know, aqueous medium kind of thing. Uh, then there's uh, oil medium. So this goes up to about 1.45 NA for the pretty high ones. Um, and it's often used for high magnification objectives. Uh, 40X or higher are frequently, but certainly not always oil. Um, there's uh, other more exotic media and things that can take you up to really high NAs, but um, um, they aren't very common. I'm not going to address them here. 
So here we have resolution. Real resolution uh, is determined directly from the wavelength and the numerical aperture of the objective. So the most common definition in microscopy anyway is the Abbe diffraction limit D. And D is defined as the wavelength divided by two times the numerical aperture. So for this example off to the right, we have a 40x magnification. Doesn't matter, but it's there. 1.3 NA and uh, 500 nanometer uh, light. So if we have a 500 nanometer light, we divide by two times the NA, so 500 over 2.6, gives us 192 nanometers. That's the smallest uh, features we can resolve and differentiate between the two, um, uh, between the, the features. So uh, features smaller than this limit cannot be resolved from each other. Uh, using conventional imaging, there's super resolution and things like that. They kind of break this rule in a way, but um, this is more conventional imaging. Um, so we have two spots that that approach each other. So uh, these are obviously well resolved. We can tell that there's two spots here. Uh, here they're closer, they're they're touching, uh, and we have a pinch point in the middle. We can still kind of resolve them. Here they're overlapping by about 50%, and at, at this particular resolution setting, uh, you can see that we can, can't really tell them apart that much. They're a little bit elongated, but uh, we don't have the resolution to do it. Uh, we also have an example here where we you can see pretty fine features and this might be a little small. You see pretty fine features here, but you know if you blur it a little bit, obviously the features aren't as fine. So this would be a high NA objective on the left and a low NA objective on the right. Uh, this may also be limited by something like a camera or your pixel size. If your pixel size is representing a one micron area of your sample and your resolution is 200 nanometers obviously your resolution is going to be limited by your camera not your uh, objective in that case so these all interplay with each other so field of view is uh, an another uh, common topic so we get this from the field number on the objective. So we're interested in field of view, field size, and field number, and they're all related to each other. So if you look at this uh, field size, field size is a sample area that can be imaged uh, by a given objective with a particular tube lens. Get to that in a sec. So field uh, size is the field number given on the objective divided by the objective magnification. Um, so Tube lens focal length can affect the field size of magnification. Uh, so for this example off to the right, uh, we have a 40X objective with a field number of 26 and a half millimeters. So 20, uh, 40X with a 26 and a half, you would see it's 26 and a half divided by 40X, which gives us a viewable area of 663 microns. So that's as much stuff as we can see in one field of view of this uh, objective. If we set everything else up right, that's the most we can see using this objective. Um, a 10X example from Thor Labs with a field number of 22, you'd see 2.2 millimeters. So you see a lot more stuff if you if all other things are cooperating with you. Um, if you zoom in and you really want to get high resolution, uh, see those small features and you get 100X with the same field number, 26 and a half, You'd get only uh, easy math there, uh, 265 microns field of view. A great resolution, 265 microns, but it's really, really small. So sometimes low magnification can be good. If you want to see a ton of neurons and you don't care quite as much about the resolution, you can pay a penalty on resolution to see a larger field of view. Lower NA, but bigger, uh, lower magnification gives you a larger area of view. So um, I've been talking in field sizes so far and field numbers, but field of view is the area within the field size that is actually viewed. So if you have a very, very large field size, but you have a very small sensor like a camera, so many sensors are smaller than the field size, you'll see that um, you're only seeing a, a fraction of the field of view. So very big camera sensors can make a lot of sense in those cases. So last topic for the moment, tube lens focal length. So tube lens is super important again. So uh, different manufacturers have settled on different focal lengths for tube lenses. And uh, it's just pretty much by company. 
Uh, Thor Labs, Nikon, Leica, and Mendotuyo use uh, 200 millimeter focal length tube lenses. Olympus uses 180, and Zeiss uses 165. We like to point this out because uh, you know you're building your system. You may not be using only our components, um, so it's useful to know uh, that different manufacturers just kind of settled on different values. Um, so what this actually does is it shifts the effective magnification. So there's a design magnification. So if we have our objective over to the right, and it happens to expect that it has a 180 millimeter tube lens focal length, but it's installed on the Thorlabs microscope, it's designed for uh, 180 uh, millimeters, but we've used a, a 200 millimeter tube lens. Well, we can uh, use this equation here which is 40x times 200 over 180 to determine that this is actually this 40x objective is acting as if it is a 44.4x objective so uh, it's pretty simple math but you need to keep it in mind if you start switching objectives around between manufacturers uh, and in biology and a lot of imaging it's kind of hard to notice that you're off by you know 11 percent so uh, there's a detailed tutorial also online under magnification of field of view. So uh, we're going to tie the room together. We're going to talk about a, a fairly complex example that you might actually build. And it's very similar uh, to some systems that uh, we have in the field right now. So we're going to use our uh, example 40X objective, which uh, is designed for a 180 millimeter tube lens. And it's going to be imaging through a Thor Labs tube lens of 0.75x that has a focal length of 150 millimeters. And it's going to be imaging onto a Thor Labs CS2100 scientific CMOS camera, which has a fairly small sensor compared to the field number. So our effective magnification for this 40x objective is 40x uh, times 150 over 180 so about 33x field size of 26 and a half divided by 33.3 gives you a uh, field size now that's the area at the sample that you might be able to view of 795 microns so the camera sensor is actually smaller than the field number so you can see that down here the field number is 26 and a half millimeters uh, diameter, but the camera sensor is only about 10 ish by 5 ish millimeters. Um, so it is blowing up what is seen in front of the objective to an area of green, and the camera sensor is much smaller. So this camera sensor area is actually the field of view. That's what you can actually see when you're doing your experiment. So uh, if we take this ratio, we'll figure out that about 30, if in the X direction anyway, uh, we have 37% of this area is uh, viewable. So uh, in the X direction, instead of 795 microns of viewable area, we have 294 microns. Uh, likewise, each pixel on this particular camera is a five micron pixel. So five microns divided by 33X gives you uh, an area of the sample of 150 nanometers in X or Y uh, that is represented on each pixel. So we established that for this objective, it has a diffraction limit of about 192 uh, nanometers. Um, so 192 nanometers and each pixel represents 150 nanometers. Each pixel, uh, each the smallest resolvable feature would only take up about 1.3 uh, pixels. So if you're really, really needing that diffraction limit, this would probably not be the ideal setup. But if you want to see a larger area with a 40x objective, get pretty good resolution. This is a pretty good setup. Um, this is a lot to go through, uh, and I'll remind you that our webinars are online, um, so you can refer back to this later um, for for reference if you're setting up your own system. So uh, now we have uh, imaging modalities. So uh, these are going to be brief introductions that are going to be expanded on in later webinars, but I kind of want to show how what I've talked about so far rolls into these uh, modalities at a very uh, first kind of approximation level. So first question is, uh, what are you trying to look at? If somebody calls me on the phone, they say, I want to build a microscope, I want to buy a microscope, I'm going to say, what are you looking at? Um, 
so if you're looking at materials like silicon, microchips, something like that, uh, reflection is really common, or in some specific applications, uh, pulsed IR uh, light uh, is, is pretty useful. Uh, for polymers, uh, usually uh, either a wide field, wide field fluorescence microscope or a uh, confocal uh, single photon uh, microscope if you're interested in the 3D elements of that. Uh, for biological samples, if it's uh, cultured cells or in vitro, uh, confocal or wide field can be good. Uh, confocal gives, gives you some flexibility with the filtering and some 3D sectioning capability. Uh, but if it's just cells on glass um, and you just are interested in the overall structure, uh, wide field can be uh, great for that. Um, for uh, brain slices and tissue sections, those are a little thicker. And you're usually interested in 3D information uh, at that point. Uh, a confocal, possibly with an IR camera to really look through those samples and get some transmission information along with the confocal information can be really great. Uh, for in vivo brain imaging or very, very thick samples, uh, multi-photon, either 2P or 3P is probably where you want to go. So 2P uh, can easily get down to six or 800 microns. If you're uh, very careful, you can get down to about a millimeter of depth. Uh, 3P is uh, a bit more involved, but you can go deeper than that, uh, almost two millimeters, I think, very, very deep. Uh, and you can image through uh, thinned skull. So uh, imaging modalities. Uh, bright field and dot. So bright field is referring to the kind of light you're getting. So, uh, but what kind of samples? I said this, a little bit of this before, fairly thin samples, uh, thin, fairly thin slices, uh, cells grown on glass, that kind of thing. Um, it does not require fluorescence. So you don't have to worry about dyes. You can image this without uh, any dyes at all if you want any stains at all. If you add stains for certain features, obviously that's kind of nice. Uh, illumination is going to be trans, so it's going to come from the other side through the objective to your uh, detectors behind the objective. Um, so bright field refers to the light being a broad spectrum source uh, usually. So it could be a single color. It could be an LED like a green or red LED or something, uh, but it may also be just a white lamp. That's bright field. Uh, wide field is imaging the entire sample at the same time. So you're lighting up the entire sample or a, a larger area of it. Uh, then that image is being projected onto a multi-element detector like your eyes that have all these cells in the back of them uh, for picking up uh, an, an entire image at the same time. Or a camera, which of course has many, many pixels uh, for uh, imaging an entire image at the same time. Uh, for increasing contrast, there's transmitted, oblique, uh, DIC, and DOT, as I mentioned. Uh, DOT's an interesting method. It's compatible with uh, laser scanning and stuff. Uh, you start out with a light source here, uh, and you introduce, through the use of a mask and a couple of diffusers, a gradient, which is uh, relayed through the system, and gives you this interesting uh, perspective where you have it as if the light's coming from the side. Uh, you get a gradient in shadows and all that. And imaging is with camera eyepieces. Uh, wide field of fluorescence, um, thin in vitro samples again, slices. Uh, it requires uh, fluorescence, so you have to have fluorescent proteins, fluorescent tags, something like that in there. Uh, illumination is going to be uh, epi, it's going to be through the objective, uh, and you're going to have that light source be an LED, a lamp, or a laser typically. Um, so the key, let's see, we have um, an, a, an essential element of this is that we excite at one wavelength and we emit at another wavelength. So we excite in this case with blue light and we're going to get green light out if our fluorophore is uh, fluorescein here. So um, we got our light source goes through some conditioning optics and there's an excitation filter here, which only lets through the blue light that will excite our sample. It uh, illuminates onto our sample, a large area of our sample. Uh, some lower energy photons are emitted off. Uh, that's our signal. And this dichroic mirror separates the uh, absorbing, the light that it would absorb from the light that's emitted. So only the light that's generated from the sample makes it through this mirror. And again, there's a filter here to uh, uh, beat down any uh, background even more. 
So uh, at our imaging plane, what the only thing we're getting there is our photons that were generated from our sample. Um, so this, of course, leads to high contrast. Uh, that's really the advantage of fluorescence in one word, uh, contrast. So we have very dark background, black backgrounds uh, typically, and very, very bright uh, images. Uh, and of course, you can combine this. So this is an example of uh, transmission combined with fluorescence. So you can get information like uh, we can see where all of our cells are, but only this, several of these cells have fluorescence uh, going on in them, and some are not labeled, uh, which might be scientifically relevant. Um, and uh, imaging is done with cameras, eyepieces. You can do it with multiple color channels pretty easily. So for uh, confocal microscopy, um, again, it's a fluorescence method. Uh, typically, though, you can do reflection, which is a reflection-based method. So for fluorescence method, it's uh, what you want to do if you need to get 3D information. It's for thicker slices, uh, typically biology. So uh, illumination is done uh, in the epi geometry uh, with a laser almost always. And uh, it's focused uh, at the sample, not bright field. And this focal spot moves around on the sample. Uh, as it moves around, uh, the uh, image, the photons are collected at the uh, on several PMTs. They're single element detectors. They only collect uh, one signal at a time, no pixels. So. Um, and any out of focus light is blocked by a uh, pinhole uh, before the PMTs. So the pinhole blocks out of focus light. The PMTs collect the light that remains, and uh, the spot moves around, giving you a uh, a picture, uh, allowing you to assemble a picture. And you could end up with uh, multi-channel, very bright, vibrant uh, pictures, as you see here. Uh, as I said, 3D is the most important aspect of uh, confocal imaging. So um, then there is multi-photon. Uh, multi-photon is pretty similar to confocal in many ways. It uses a scanning uh, dot uh, to move around, and it collects the uh, it collects the photons onto usually higher sensitivity gallium arsenide PMTs. And uh, multi-photon uses some special tricks, uh, including using a highly focused uh, pulsed IR beam uh, to induce fluorescence only exactly at the focus of the laser beam. So um, you don't have to worry about out of focus light in this setup, so there's actually no pinhole. Um, we use uh, IR light for this application, so it doesn't scatter as much as it goes through tissue, uh, skull, whatever. Um, and that's um, that's an advantage of IR light and uh, pulsed imaging. This will be covered in much more detail in a later webinar. So uh, just a brief glimpse at uh, some of the uh, devices that are available for the CERNA platform and some pre-configured uh, setups. So um, this is a uh, camera transmission uh, epi illumination setup. Um, this is an intrinsic imaging setup. Uh, there's a, a huge number of devices all available, and this doesn't even cover all of them. It just covers a lot of them. So we're going to see a little video here, and I think it'll play. Let's see. OK. So we're going to see a microscope constructed in basically real time. So this is about five minutes of, uh, of construction compressed down into about a minute. So we have a CERNA microscope body here and a platform uh, going on the top. So the platform is uh, allowing our engineer here to uh, put his epi illumination light source and his camera on top of the uh, microscope. So he's uh, done that and so he's attached an objective mover there for focusing and now he's a attaching an XY brushless motor. He's hard to keep up with here. Uh, so for XY movement, now he's adding an objective onto that and that's motor controlled so he can get uh, uh, easy focusing, Z stacks, that kind of thing. Now he's adding his transmitted pathway, his uh, trans illumination pathway. He's using a lens tube in place of a uh, condenser here. And there's some uh, laser fiber input off to the side uh, that you can see coming towards us and to the right. Back and to the left, there's a uh, LED illumination. He's hooking up the laser now, hooking up the epi illumination, and, uh, and that's it. Let me pause that for a moment. So um, 
we have uh, LED power here, uh, focus movement here, the XY behind uh, behind YouTube suggestions suggestions for me here. Um, and uh, yeah, really, you can take these components, set them up on a table, and it takes less than five minutes to actually put everything onto the microscope body. Uh, building a few of these things might take a little bit longer, of course, but uh, that's really what we're trying to do. Give you the tools to build uh, the uh, devices you need to do uh, your imaging. So um, that's it. So um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Thank you, Craig, for that presentation. I'm going to read some of the questions that um, came over in the chat. Um, so let me just open it up. Uh, first question that I have here is when using an immersion objective, why does the cover glass thickness matter? Okay. Um, the cover glass thickness, I don't have any diagrams prepared to really illustrate this. Um, the cover glass uh, has a different index uh, from the um, the immersion medium and from other things. So it doesn't behave quite invisibly. It, it may if you get really good oil matching the cover glass. Anyway, it reflects refracts the light in such a way that it will um, change how it focuses, uh, change how the light focuses at the uh, at the focal point. Uh, this brings up the idea of something we call a point spread function. So point spread function is how small your uh, focus is at, uh, in front of your objective. So um, if you really correct for everything, you'll have a very small point spread function. Uh, this also defines your resolution kind of. So um, and it'll become elongated and maybe distorted if you have a different cover glass. And um, that's that's a little bit more for uh, a really hardcore optics designer uh, to get into more detail on that. But um, basically, uh, it will refract in certain ways that make your point spread function uh, larger in certain ways. And um, and that's kind of uh, how that works. Okay, and uh, just a follow up question to that. So is that related to the correction ring that's typically on objectives? It is, yeah. So uh, as the correction ring moves, you'll have a lens inside that actually moves up and down on a, a very carefully designed uh, threading. So as that uh, lens moves up and down, it's applying a different level or different orientation of correction for those light beams traveling through the objective. So if you have a very thin cover glass, it doesn't need quite as much correction. So that lens will be in one position inside the objective. If you have a very thick cover glass, 230 microns in one example here, um, then you'll have that lens in a different position, which applies a lot more correction. And if you uh, if you look at the point spread function, which is a whole different conversation, uh, you'll notice that it gets smaller and larger uh, as you adjust that correction collar closer and further from uh, the proper value. Yeah. Um, next question here, still related to the objective. Um, somebody's asking if you know you have two objectives uh, with equal and a mm -hmm. um, same magnification. Okay. But when has a larger working distance, does that objective necessarily need to be wider in diameter? Uh, typically it will. Um, so um, we have a Thorlabs 10X objective and it's got a 0.5 NA and that's pretty high for a 10X objective. And this objective is very large. Um, it, the opening at the end is maybe almost a centimeter it's very large if you get a 10x uh, 0.3 na it's got a much smaller lens on the front so yes you got the idea that if it's collecting a certain cone of light um that the that front lens typically has to be larger uh, the exception might be if you have you didn't specify your immersion there so if you have one immersion that is in air it uh it it may collect um Let's see if you have, let's say, a 0.8 NA objective, you could design a 0.8 NA, 0.8 NA objective that is oil. And so it would uh, not need to be quite as large because the beams come out and they don't refract the same way. So that's another way you could kind of uh, maybe use the same lens and have a longer work, working distance. But typically, yes, I'll say typically, yes, you'll you'll have 
the higher the NA at the same mag, you'll typically have a larger objective. True. Okay. Um, follow up question basically for immersion objectives, let's say an oil immersion. Mm -hmm. What is the effect when you use them in air? It will look terrible. <laughs> um, that's you know that's what you're going to notice right away. It will be like, gosh, why isn't it focusing? Um, yeah, you'll you'll kind of see something, but it'll be super blurry. It's it'd be like if you took your glasses and you you know coated them with oil or something like that. Everything's just going to be all over the place. Um, but w one thing that that is not exactly what you asked, but um, is is happens a lot with water immersion objectives. Water is a very thin fluid compared to oil and the working distances are some kind of sometimes kind of long. So if you have an objective with a three millimeter working distance with water, that water column can be kind of hard to actually hold in place. Sometimes it drops. If you move your objective just a little far, far away, you'll lose that water column. So you'll be like, yeah, my my image looks pretty good. I'm just going to you know, focus up a little bit. And all of a sudden your image turns terrible. You can't see anything. Uh, it's probably a good time to look at your objective and double check whether or not you lost your water column and you need to put a little bit more water there. Can happen with oil, but the working distances are a lot shorter. Uh, so it's not usually quite as much of a problem. Mm -hmm. Next question that I have, I think, came uh, when you were discussing uh, white field and mm -hmm. uh, dot and DIC. So the mm -hmm. question is, what is the purpose of an IR camera for tissue sections? Oh, that's yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, typically for patch clamping. So if you have a uh, electrode uh, at the end of a needle or just you know sharpened uh, glass pipette um, for micro injection or, or patch clamping. Um, you might have a tissue section, so you'll uh, take your your microscope, um, and I've seen this on multi-photon microscopes. You'll image down. You'll find a cell that's of interest, in, and maybe it's this deep in your image in your um, uh, tissue section, uh, and you really want to you really want to find out what's going on in that cell. So then you'll bring in your micro injection needle, your uh, micro pipette, and you'll want to inject into that. Well, your injection pipette is may not be fluorescent so you'll need a camera ir like eight nine hundred nanometers can penetrate tissue a lot better and you'll see this of course if you if you take a, a white flashlight and shine it through your hand you might see a little bit of red light getting through but you're probably not going to see any blue light getting through so the red light can penetrate through the tissue section better than uh visible wavelengths um so uh our cameras i not sure about other companies, but many cameras come with an IR filter. And with our cameras, you can basically just take a tool and remove it if you want. Um, and I've done that in the field so that, you know, we, we can look at IR light. Um, so patching, clamping, seeing what's going on deep inside that tissue. If you have, say, a millimeter thick tissue, um, that's when you would typically want IR camera, IR light source. Okay. So next question is um, kind of uh related to this thing. Basically, they're asking us to discuss the wavelength limitations given an optical system. You know, what's the trade off between optimizing for narrow wavelengths versus broad wavelengths? Um, and maybe discuss that okay. in terms of some of our systems where we combine visible and IR light. Yeah, so that no, that's a great question. Um, so for our example here, um, if we if we look at these uh, microscope systems in front of me here, so this is a design for an IR laser. This is our Tiberius laser here, and um, a very common thing for people to look at uh, with these lasers is uh, I don't know if we can see that. Let me put my laser pointer on there. Okay, uh, is this uh, Tiberius laser here? So a very common way thing for people to want to look at these days is a protein called GCAMP. It's a fluorescent protein. It fluoresces green, and people usually excite it with about 920 to 940 nanometers. So we'll say 940 nanometers. So if you want to hit it with 940 nanometers, um, all of your optics along your optical pathway have to either reflect or transmit, depending on if it's a mirror or a lens, um, that wavelength. So um, we design, in this case, we, we have some pretty wide ranges, like uh, 680 nanometers up to, I think, thir maybe seven, 13 or 1700 nanometers, I think is the upper limit for those for that lens. Um, but so if you're, if you're shining 405 through there, you're gonna you're gonna 
suffer a bit. So if it's designed for IR, it may not be as good in the visible. If it's good in the visible, it may not be as good in IR. Uh, I think you already knew that. I feel like I'm wandering. Anyway, um, it is a it is a huge consideration. It's kind of tricky sometimes to mix uh, visible with infrared, especially you know the further into the infrared you go. Um, some of our optics are designed uh, specifically to hit the wavelengths that our customers are, are interested in. And by the way, our scan lenses, our tube lenses, uh, some of our mirrors are available on the web as well. Uh, so you can see the wavelength ranges for that. Um, but yes, I, I acknowledge that that's a consideration and uh, you, you need to check your wavelengths, um, whether it's A-coded, B-coded, C-coded optics. Uh, we we have, have all the information on there, so don't forget to do that. Uh, dispersion can also be an issue. Uh, of circumstance where you might want to go narrow range is if you have a 1040 laser, for instance, and you want those pulses from that laser to be as narrow as possible. You need to be, need to be very careful with, with which optics you pick. And if you pick optics for 1040, certain kinds of optics for 1040, but then you try to image at 940, uh, that may widen those pulses through weird physics stuff, uh, dispersion, um, more than you expect. So you, if you choose your optics for a narrow band, you really need to be careful if you go wide band. If you go wide band, you're going to have maybe a little less transmission, but you're going to have a lot more flexibility uh, with your wavelengths. Um, maybe that's a good answer. Okay. Um, so two questions uh, related to, you know, multi-photon and two-photon systems. So first is, uh, what is the typical intensity of illumination that we use? Um, and then the next thing is basically, can you talk about how you use uh, galvanometers in microscopy systems? Okay. Galvanometers meaning, meaning galvo mirrors. Galvo, I assume yes. that Yeah, okay, just making sure. Um, so the first question, uh, Pauline, that was for multi-photon for power levels, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll say for confocal applications, um, uh, typically the light coming out of our laser is in the 20 millow milliwatt range. You don't need really that much power. I mean, it looks bright if you look at it with your eye, but you know, it's, it's uh, not really that much power. When it gets to infrared, um, the guidance right now, the thinking in kind of the community is that uh, most of the time you want to try to stay below about 100 milliwatts at your sample. Um, if you're going very, very deep, you're going to need uh, all the power you can get potentially. So if you decide you want to go all the way down to a millimeter, uh, you may want 200 milliwatts. Uh, but these are kind of the ranges we're talking about. If you're imaging cells on a slide, uh, 20 milliwatts, 50 milliwatts, that's probably fine. Um, but you're going to need more power than if you did single photon uh, confocal. And uh, can you remind me? Oh, galvanometers. Um, so we, if you're talking about scan heads, we have uh, two common kinds of scan heads right now. Uh, we have a resonance galvo scan head and galvo galvo scan head. Um, Galvo Galvo has uh, two mirrors that uh, uh, move and we can send them to any location we want. We send a voltage, uh, they will uh, orient to a certain uh, angle um, and uh, each one of them can be oriented however we want at any point. Um, so we can direct the beam wherever we want. We can keep it there. We can make weird patterns. We can burn holes. We can do all kinds of interesting things. With resonance Galvo, we have one mirror that always resonates at the same frequency. It always resonates uh, either 12 or 8 kilohertz for our systems. And then we have another one that's a Galvo. We can point anywhere. But this resonant mirror, it's limited. It's like a tuning fork. So if you hit a tuning fork, you can't really decide to have the tuning fork bend this way and stay there. It's always going back and forth. Um, so the Galvos allow us to uh, point the beam wherever we want. Uh, a resonant mirror paired with a Galvo will uh, be a little bit more restricted, but a heck of a lot faster, like 30 frames per second versus three frames per second. Uh, we have another scan head called a resonance Galvo Galvo scan head or RGG, uh, which kind of is the best of both worlds. Uh, that'll be another presentation, I think. Cool. Um, I also just want to add that there was a previous webinar uh, about ultra fast lasers for multi-photon imaging. I think that has a lot of information mm -hmm. in terms of intensities needed um, for imaging at different yeah. depths. A lot of great info on that one, yeah. 
Okay, so I guess I'm going to ask one last question. Um, okay. When determining the resolution of a wide field system, which wavelength do you use as an input to the Abbey formula? You know, for example, if you're looking at the stain section, um, would you use around 600? Um, and then how do you determine the Z resolution in this case? <laughs> that's a that's a tough question. OK, so um, I'm going to simplify this slightly uh, first. Um, if you had a green fluorescent sample uh, that's uh, got GFP in it, that's about 525 nanometers. So you would just the light coming into your objective, making it to your camera through all your optics is 525. You would use 525. Um, now you asked about transmission. If you had a stain 600 nanometers, um, it's going to be it's going to be a combination, I think, of all the colors that you have. If you had a white light source and you have a lot of colors make it to, making it to your camera, I think some of the wavelengths are going to be one resolution. Some of the wavelengths are going to be another. Um, so you would probably just choose the peak, um, but you would. If you had such a question, you would want to determine the resolution for yourself. So the way you would do that briefly is you would find a feature or get uh, microspheres are common for this, but get spheres or features which are smaller than your diffraction limit. You might choose 20 nanometer uh, spheres, which are really tough in transmission, a lot easier in fluorescence. Um, you disperse those nicely, so you're pretty sure you have single spheres. And then you're gonna see that they're all about the same size because they're 20 nanometers or smaller, smaller than the diffraction limit. So you take a picture and then you um, full width half max is kind of used as a good approximation of the resolution. So you're going to see this, this Gaussian blur and you look at it in profile and it's going to have something kind of like a Gaussian shape. Uh, it's really an Abbey function, but we'll pretend it's Gaussian. Uh, measure the width when it's half of the peak and that will be a good measure of the resolution of your system. So with, with, these, with these complicated situations, you may have an optic that's not quite allowing diffraction limited imaging, or your wavelength might be a little bit off of what you expect, or it's a combination of wavelengths or whatever. Uh, just measure it. Try to get something that is smaller than the diffraction limit and take a picture and uh, look at that. And that's uh, ultimately, what you should do if you're determined to find out what your resolution of your system is. OK, I think that's it for the questions. Thank you very much, Craig, and thank you for everyone who joined us today. I hope you join us for in the next installment, which is going to be about DIY microscopy. If you have any questions, our contact info is on the screen. Uh, have a good rest of the day to everyone. Thank you. Bye.